So, Reem, I'm really interested in uh, Syrian culture, I should say. I'm going to leave the air conditioner on. Don't worry about that. Um, your name, Kahuta. Katuta. Katuta. Is it, what does that mean? Is that some I always people. What, what is it, that? it means it's governor in the name of God. It's a Persian word that the Turkish used to uh, give a title to a person who was like a chancellor, the holder of a stamp. So he was governor in the name of God. Mm. The way they ruled their occupation is by giving local leaders uh, mm -hmm. some responsibilities, but also reporting responsibilities to them. So you will have Katkhudas also in Libya and in Jordan and in other countries. It wasn't just in Syria. And um, Katkhuda is also Kihya, which is the same meaning, but differently pronounced. That one is mine. So, yeah. So, what, but you said it's Persian. I'm, I'm confused. It, 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 it's it, a Persian it, word used by the Turks that were given to Arabs in Syria when uh, Turkey occupied the land in Syria. They assigned local leaders responsibilities, mm -hmm. and they called them Katkhuda. Okay. No, do, do you have a big... Is that a clan name? Do you have a big clan? With well, it's very interesting, because I actually did a social experiment on Facebook. I figured with the civil war in Syria, we are a big family. So I started to befriend everybody who's named Katkhuda or Kihya on Facebook. Oh, and wait, 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 wait. What's that? So let me get closer with this one. What's that second name? Kihya. Well, how do you spell that one? K-E-K-H-I-A. Oh, that's a lot easier. Okay. <laughs> and because it's easier, when Katkhuda went into politics, they used the name Kihya because it's easier for the people to remember it mm. so that to elect them. My family was in the government of Syria before the Ba'as. Okay, hold on a second, hold on a second. Let me go back just for a second. When you said it was easier for the people, now when people look, think of Syria, is it a, a middle class country? Is it mainly poor? When you say easy for the people, what does that mean? The people weren't literate? I mean, there were elections. After they, mm -hmm. kicked, up the Fr they kicked out the French, mm -hmm. um, they started holding elections. Mm -hmm. And so people ran for office. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted the uh, uh, voters to be able to remember their name. In Egypt, a lot of people are illiterate, so political um, people, candidates to positions, would have a symbol. Oh. So they will know that the hand or the chicken, or I don't know, I'm inventing symbols, I don't know what they oh, are. But it. it's true, yeah. they actually, a political candidate mm -hmm. would have a symbol, and in Egypt, that's what they use. In Syria, I was like here, well, they would I, know the name of the candidate. I have a great South African story. You know, when Madiba, Mandela was, was, was free, and it was the first election, right? Right. Nobody really knew what he looked like. And in some uh, a province, you know, out there, they had a, another candidate, or a candidate, and he, it was a, a black guy, too. And a lot of people voted for him, not knowing who was, who was Madiba like that. So I hear what you're saying about right. the symbols and stuff like that. Okay. Right. So in Syria, it's a name like everywhere. And Katkhuda is very difficult, mm. even for Arabs and even for Syrians. So they used Kihya because it was our, our name too, but it was easier to remember. Mm -hmm. Now, you were talking earlier about your, your father and his position and, 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 and your mother and her position, and, or by extension somehow, your position. Can you just recount? Okay. Them? So when Syrians kicked out the French, Syria was under French mandate, not occupation, but they still needed to kick the French out with a bloody uprising. All the Syrians were together. Once the French were kicked out, the Syrians broke into two groups, the family party or the patri party and the people's party. The patri, meaning the, the, the country party, believed that the prominent families should rule. And the rest are too ignorant, too illiterate, too incapable. Mm -hmm. And the People's Party believed that every person is with their own uh, qualifications, so it shouldn't be limited to their background. Mm -hmm. Funny enough, my family is divided between the two. My grandfather, which is the father of my father, was the uh, uh, Minister of Justice, and he was part of the People's Party. My, his cousin was the head of the People's Party, not the Patri, mm. and he believed that everybody. My father's allegiance was to his father, but his, um, his uh, beliefs was much more 
that every person deserves a credit by their own, not by their family. Funny enough, my mother's father and her uncle were part of the People's Party. So even though they came from prominent family and educated families, they believed that everybody should have a credit by what they do, not where they came from. In Arabic, they say, لا تقل فصلي وأصلي إن أصل الفتى ما قد فعل Don't tell, that's my background and that's my name. The um, honor and the background of a person is what he does. Mm -hmm. And this was the motto of the People's Party. Mm -hmm. So um, then this divided, and then there were a lot of coups that changed Syria. And every coup, my grandparents used to be in um, house arrest or confinement. I remember sometime at my mother's 36th birthday, we went to visit her uncle in um, obligatory confinement in a house somewhere near Palmyra. Mm. And um, we didn't talk much about politics as I was growing up. And we went to Lebanon very young because my parents figured if they cannot give us wealth, they might as well at least give us uh, um, education. Mm. But before that, what happened is that through elections, the Ba'ath Party, which declared itself socialist, rose to power and it was the same party in iraq and in syria and then um, they became the party eventually the assad family if i understood correctly took over the party and that's when the iraqis split oh wait a second but now, that's history that i'm not too accurate about okay, I've never I, been I, too great I was going to have a question with that only because uh, because remember the the americans if you want to north america whatever the united states uh, did Iraq first, but they, it seems like they wanted to go to Syria also. It seemed like it's almost like that was the same thing. I don't want to get into the policy of that, but I, it just brings that to mind when, when you talk about that. Yeah, so the parties divided and separated. Mm. And then uh, Saddam Hussein headed Iraq and the Assad uh, headed Syria. And then mm. his son inherited the head of the democracy. Mm -hmm. okay. The rest is history. Yeah. So, on a family level, um, we, we moved to Lebanon uh, in the late 60s. And, um, and, you know, I grew up without pa my parents talking much politics. When the civil war in Lebanon started, I learned it from the streets. Mm. And uh, initially, I was in the mountain, which is more of a right-wing and phalangist um, bringing and I came very proud to my father at 14 telling him how I'm gonna train with the Maronite militia to protect the mountain from the Palestinian mm -hmm. in 24 hours my father packed us in a car and took us to Syria because mm -hmm. unbeknown to me being a Muslim and being a Syrian in that mountain when everybody's training their youth to bear arms against the Palestinian would not have gone very well. I didn't know much about all of that. Mm. When we came back to Lebanon, we had come back to our apartment, which was in West Beirut, which means more of the pro-Palestinian um, and the left wing, uh, the left leaning, if you would, parties. of. Mm. And then I realized a whole other narrative. And at 14, 15, I realized that a political perspective is a matter of perspective and where you're looking at. Mm. And the people in the mountain had very different ideas and skewed views of the people in uh, West Lebanon and the people in West Lebanon of the mountain. Mm. And that's where I started having my critical um, analysis of history and me wanting to allow people to tell the story and hear each other. Mm -hmm. It came from that times. I refused to bear arms. My family was very pacifist, so was I. But I didn't want to be a negation in all this war. So I started volunteering in the emergency room. Mm, in the hospital. No, but, but you said you went back to Syria. When did that? Um, in 2010. No, I came to the U.S. to do my master's, and uh, this was in 1983. And I stayed to practice computer in Wall Street and understand how corporate USA functions. Mm -hmm. So I was a management consultant. I worked um, on Wall Street for 12 years. My plan was 10 years, and I could tour the world to understand how what moves the U.S. so that they can have the politics that they have. 
and how we can change that so that they'll be the proponent of of peace and harmony in the world as opposed to wars and invasion. Mm. Remember, I was in Lebanon when the U.S. Embassy was bombed. Mm. And we had vintage point because I was at the American University when the explosion happened. And we looked from the window and we could see helicopters pulling up black Attache cases before we started hearing the ambulances for some 15 minutes before the ambulances came in. Mm. This blew my mind. Why? What was going on? And I felt, and then Reagan was in power in the U.S. and he ordered bombing of Lebanese villages that were pro-USA. It didn't make sense. So I was also curious to come here and understand what's going on. So in a country that I was taught was a democracy, it had such uh, incoherent behavior abroad. Well, too bad you wasn't at BAI then because I remember when that happened. I mean, in fact, David Rothenberg was on the air in the early morning when that happened. And, and that weekend, they said they were going to, uh, well, before, yeah, yeah when, that, that, when that had the, that weekend, um, they uh, had a meeting. They took it, it was talked about Lebanon, but they ended up, uh, that, 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 yeah, that, they were, that Wednesday morning, something like that, invading Grenada. And then they, put, they, they basically did dead from, from uh, Lebanon and the dead from, and the bodies from uh, Grenada were all put together. So nobody knew what was really going on. It was really a diabolical uh, yeah, move. that's Here's where my please. stance for being anti-war comes from. And I'm excited that we're talking with the leadership of Zul to be creating a world without war chapter in New York City now. Mm. What's, Here we uh, are uh, some 38 years later. I mean, what's, what's, what's Zul? What? No, Zul is going to be spearheading the world without war chapter in New York City. Okay. Um, the first event is... Uh, that uh, rising together uh, in, uh, I mean, on the it, 19th of September in New York City in Foley Square, across mm -hmm. from the courthouse. But is Zul an organization or a person? What's that? Zul is the name of a person who's okay. going to be spearheading okay. the World Without War okay. organization chapter of New York City. Okay, okay, okay. okay but I want to go, let's go back to your affair. I know I'm jumping around. But you said something very interesting about being the firstborn. And, and, and so I was in the U.S. I stayed in the U.S. I worked on Wall Street for 12 years. Then I started working in media. I learned radio. I worked with WBI. Then Pacifica created WBIX, the Refugees uh, Radio Network, or WBI in Exile. Then I went down to D.C. I was an interim news director. I created people's media, the DC radio co-op first with you mm -hmm. and Rupert, then we created the People's Media Center when we were pushed out of uh, WPFW. And um, in after all of that, 2010, it was the 50th anniversary of my parents. By then, I hadn't been in the region for 12 years. Mm -hmm. And um, I went down to be with them and I went to Syria, I went to Lebanon, and I had closed uh, people's media center buildings in D.C. There were four buildings and a community center because the buildings were falling apart. I had come back to New York because my partner was diagnosed with lung cancer. And um, I was rethinking what I want to do. So when he passed away, it was my parents' anniversary. I went there and my nephews were like, we need a people's media center in Syria. And the Lebanese were like, we need you to do the work here. Because learning how to do independent media will be very important. So I thought I should go back. But while I'm thinking about it, my father called on me. and He said, I'm getting old. And I am the power of attorney of all the extended family. His mom had 12 siblings. And the land is not properly divided among all of them. Though our property of land was uh, nationalized, we still owned a lot of land. So he called on me. He said, you're the oldest. And in my culture, my mom was the oldest of her siblings. My dad was the oldest of his siblings. And I'm the oldest. We're groomed differently. So he called his, on his chips. Is that the American expression? What is it? He oh, called, calling, calling, calling his chips. He yeah. called in his chips uh -huh. and said, I got to go back and help, um, uh, you know, carry the legacy. And I went down. I knew the revolution had started in Syria then. So I knew things were not too great. My aunt had been in prison, then released. I went to meet her. I talked to the lot of Syrians. I knew it's going to get bad. 
I wanted to get my father out, but at the same time, he wanted to make sure the sharecroppers know me. So he took me to the village and he introduced me to the families. And when he will tell them that should something happen to him, I'll be in charge next, the women would advance. Because suddenly by a woman being the lead in these uh, places of the owners of the land, they have a higher role. And um, so I wanted to meet with them and understand which tribe they came from, because understanding that would allow me to better manage the land. But we never had that meeting because things were getting really bad. And my mom wanted us back in Lebanon. Actually, something neither my mom nor my siblings know. When we took a taxi and we came to, back to Lebanon, the borders was closed. We had to go through none borders to cross into mm -hmm. Lebanon amongst snipers shooting. Mm -hmm. So we came back and um, by then Facebook had become more and more relevant and I figured I'll do the social experiment where I befriended anybody that has my last name, Katkhuda or Kihya. Mm -hmm. And that's when I discovered I'm part of a 25,000 people clan. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 25 who? Thousand people clan called Al Kihya. And we were the part of the clan that got educated, got more westernized, got civilized in Arabic, Hadarijin. So my parents never told us we came from tribal background. Mm. My siblings might not even own it. And um, I befriended a lot of people that, uh, funny enough, I met later at weddings and we knew each other from Facebook. Mm. And some of the youngsters also befriended me. Uh, or I befriended them and uh, and so I'm hoping that one day because they all have different political allegiances one day when the war stops in Syria and we go back for the reconstruction these relations will help me help bring harmony to the land right thank you very much for this